Welcome everyone. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Just waiting for everyone to file in. Thanks for your patience. All right, our uh, rate of new entrance is slowing a bit, so why don't we jump into this? Uh, my name is Mike Shanahan. I'm the president of the Holy Cross Alumni Association, and I, it's my pleasure to welcome so many alumni, students, and friends of Holy Cross to this virtual event this evening, organized by the Holy Cross Alumni Association. We're particularly pleased to welcome so many parents of students, past and present. One of the rare blessings of this adverse time of COVID-19 has been an increase in the opportunities for remote engagement from our community across various geographical distances and challenges. This evening's event is one such example when we originally planned this back in early April, the event was to be an in-person gathering <clears throat> at the Lincoln Campus Center uh, at Fordham University with about 200 people as a limit of our capacity. Uh, we're happy that this increased uh, technology format has allowed us to welcome more than a thousand people uh, who've signed up for this event this evening. So. Uh, We'll uh, see how, who all filters in, but we're really glad that the increased participation can be accommodated with this format. Just a couple words on logistics for this call. Thanks to all of you who took the time to send questions along for Father Martin. We'll be sharing as many as we can with him following his presentation. I'm afraid we won't be able to keep up with questions on the chat line, but we did get more than 100 questions submitted to us. So there'll be plenty of us, plenty of topics to uh, address after uh, Father Martin speaks. Uh, and one other item, you, you, you've all no doubt heard the news that the college's president, Father Philip Burroughs, has announced his plans to step down as the 32nd president of Holy Cross at the end of June, 2021. Uh, we'll we all have very big shoes to fill when he steps down. Father's led us through an incredible period of growth and introspection and is leaving the College of the Holy Cross on solid footing as we look forward to the next chapter for the college. As I turn things over to Father Burroughs to introduce his fellow Jesuit, our guest speaker this evening, please let me share my thanks on behalf of our 36,000 alumni and their families. Thanks, Father, for all you've done and will continue to do for our college. Father Burroughs? Thanks, Mike, and thank you for your leadership of the Holy Cross Alumni Association and for organizing this wonderful event this evening. It is my privilege to introduce our speaker, who is undoubtedly familiar to most of you, and that's why you've signed on. He is certainly well known across our country and across the world. An alumnus of the Wharton School of Business, he entered the Society of Jesus in 1988 after six years of working in corporate finance. And then following his years of Jesuit training, Father James Martin was ordained to the Roman Catholic priesthood in 1999 and presently is the editor at large for American Media, a consultor to the Holy See's Dicastery for Communication, and the author of many books, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, and Jesus, A Pilgrimage. His latest book, Learning to Pray, A Guide for Everyone, will be published in February. Jim is a frequent guest on television news and entertainment programs. He is an outspoken advocate for dialogue across differences, and he's a strong promoter of Ignatian spirituality and the great tradition of the Society of Jesus. If you read Jim's works carefully, you know well that he sees in Jesus' ministry to us 
the essence of what it means to embody compassion and mercy. And as we know, to embody God's compassion, Jesus himself took on the suffering of the rejected and the judged and the reviled. We celebrate all the ways in which we at the College of the Holy Cross are called to embody and exemplify Jesus' love and compassion, and we hope and pray that we too will have the courage and the freedom to follow the call that Jesus leads us on. I know that we will all enjoy a thoughtful and substantive presentation tonight, and it is a great joy for me to introduce my brother Jesuit and our speaker, Father James Martin. Jim? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Father Burroughs. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and thank you to the whole Holy Cross Alumni Association uh, for welcoming me, welcoming me here uh, tonight. Uh, as Mike was saying, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the downside is that we couldn't meet in person. The upside, of course, is that instead of 200 people, we have 1,400 people. And so I'm really happy to be here. Um, uh, one thing um, that uh, Bill, uh, Father Barrows didn't mention in his very gracious introduction is that I am a New England province Jesuit originally. Uh, and so Holy Cross um, played a big part uh, in my Jesuit life, uh, even though I'm not an alum, unfortunately. Um, my classmate, uh, Father Bill Campbell, who was uh, with uh, Holy Cross for many years, up until recently, um, uh, is a graduate of Holy Cross, and he introduced me, in a sense, to Holy Cross, and the New England province, uh, you know, further introduced me. Uh, my first ordination mass after my first retreat uh, as a Jesuit candidate was at Holy Cross. It, it sort of blew me away. I mean, as you know, that chapel is, is pretty incredible, uh, and then for many years, um, our province assemblies and our ordinations were always at Holy Cross and I, um, I just love it and I really I have a lot of fondness for Holy Cross and I always enjoy uh, meeting the alumni. So I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Um, so what, I was, what I'm asked to talk about tonight uh, is Ignatian tools uh, in this time of pandemic and I'll talk for about uh, 20 minutes or so just very briefly and then we can open it up for questions. Uh, and I want to look at three things um, that might be familiar to you but if, uh, if they are, maybe this will be a refresher. If not, I wanna introduce them to you. Uh, and those tools are discernment of spirits first, the examination of conscience second, um, and third, Ignatian contemplation. So some really basic Ignatian tools, but um, we'll look at them in the light of the pandemic. So first of all, discernment of spirits. Um, what does that mean? Well, to understand discernment of spirits, we need to know a little bit about uh, the life of St. Ignatius. I'm not going to give you his whole life story, but briefly, in case you don't remember from Holy Cross, he's, he's born in 1491 in the Basque country of Spain. Uh, he, he wants to be a knight. Um, he apprentices to a local, uh, the local nobility. Um, he becomes a soldier. Um, and he, he's very much uh, uh, taken up with impressing people, uh, certain, especially a certain lady that he talks about. He's, he's somewhat vain. In 1521, uh, in a battle in Pamplona, Spain, however, uh, he, his leg is shattered by a cannonball. And so he is brought back to his uh, family castle, I think it's his brother-in-law or his sister-in-law's castle, in Loyola, Spain, where he convalesces. And this is where Ignatian spirituality really begins in earnest. Uh, while he's on his, uh, his sickbed, uh, the only thing that people have to bring him for reading um, instead of the tales of chivalry and adventure and daring do that he would have liked, um, is, uh, is a life of Christ um, and the lives of the saints. And as he's reading the books, um, uh, you know, he's still thinking about impressing people and kind of continuing on with his soldiering career and impressing a certain lady, whoever she is. There's lots of theories about that. Um, but he, he finds that when he is thinking about impressing people and you know, trying, to, trying to do things that were sort of based on his vanity, um, it's exciting for a while, but then afterwards he's kind of left cold, right? He kind, of, he kind of feels not particularly satisfied. However, when he thinks about doing the things that the saints have done, um, and he thinks specifically of uh, St. Francis and St. Dominic, um, he is not only excited, but he's, he's, he's satisfied and he's consoled, as he says afterwards. So as, as Ignatius says, little by little, it's a great phrase, little by little, he starts to realize that this is God working in him. This is God working in him and, and helping him make a decision. So that's one of the first insights in Ignatian spirituality, 
which is um, not only that God wants us to make good decisions, which I think everybody would agree with. I mean, every Catholic and every Christian and every believer would say, yeah, of course, God wants us to make good decisions. But Ignatius's great insight was that God will help us make good decisions. And by looking at what's going on inside of us in our interior lives, um, we can understand which way uh, to go, basically. Okay, we can look at the, the impulses that come from God and the impulses that drive us away from God. Okay. Now the impulses that drive us, and the, we will get to the pandemic, I'm, I'm getting there. The impulses that sort of pull us towards God, um, he calls the good spirit. The impulses that draw us away from God are the evil spirit. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that, you know, if we were possessed, I mean, it's not like you have to think about the exorcist or anything like that. But I think that we can all agree that all of us in, interiorly feel these different um, tensions, right? Maybe towards being selfish uh, and selfless, right? Towards being stingy and generous, right? Um, towards being kind of mean and kind. And we, we feel these, these pulls within us. And Ignatius is telling us that um, through his experience and through his experience of directing people, right, and sort of reflecting on his life and their lives, we can, as he says, discern the spirits. We can tell what is coming from God, right, and what is not coming from God. All right, now, how do we do that? Okay, well, he has a, a couple techniques. Uh, and the first technique is to say that if you're a person who is trying to lead a good life, Okay, you're, you're, and I'm sure everybody on this call is probably in this uh, category. The person who's trying to go from good to better. You know, you're, you would not be listening to a, uh, to a Zoom talk on Ignatian spirituality if you weren't, you know, trying to do, do better in your life and, and lead a good life. Ignatius says for people in, in that frame of mind, uh, you know, the good spirit works gently and consoles you. Okay, uh, it builds you up, it gives you hope, it lifts you up, okay, it encourages you, it makes things seem easier, all right? Essentially, it's the voice of hope, okay? It's the voice of hope and positivity, and that makes sense, right? I mean, if you're kind of moving along in that path, God's going to want you to continue, and it's going to encourage you. The evil spirit, um, by contrast, is going to, for, for a person in this uh, frame of mind, is going to cause gnawing anxiety, set up false obstacles, tempt you to despair, okay? So anytime you feel like, oh, everything's just useless, right? I mean, that, that's the voice of despair. That is not coming from the good spirit, okay? So now in the pandemic, um, how can we see that happening? Well, simply put, uh, any, any voice inside of you, any inclination, any feeling, or anything outside of you, right, that, that gives you courage, that, that stirs up peace, that gives you tranquility, that calms you down. That's coming from God, basically, all right? So anyone who says to you or, or any voice inside of you that says, you know what, you have the resources, uh, you know, you have the mental and emotional and physical resources to get through this pandemic, you will survive, right? It will be difficult, but you will survive. Be calm with it, you know, use your brain, use your intelligence. You'll be able to handle this. You see how calm that sounds? I mean, it's even, I hear it, it sounds very calming to me, right? You'll be okay. That's God's voice. Now, Ignatius compares that to, which I think is a wonderful metaphor, the drop of water on the sponge, right? If you can think about a drop of water on a sponge, it's very gentle and it's very quiet, okay? continuing and consoling and encouraging okay by contrast the evil spirit is like the drop of water on a stone very hard right oh and you get panicky oh my gosh how am i gonna oh, oh my gosh i just saw these terrible numbers on, on on the tv and oh my gosh i'm sure we've all felt it right that that sort of panicky feeling that we get um you know that 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 it, it sort of sets up obstacles which is ignatius's term for what the the, the evil spirit does that's not coming from God. And basically, Ignatius's insight is don't listen to that voice, right? Listen to the voice that is encouraging, that is calming. That's where God wants you to go, okay? That's the voice that is going to enable you to make a good decision. So, you know, even if it seems rational or everybody else is panicking or freaking out, that is not coming from God. That is just not coming from God. So I would say that uh, kind of a, a shorthand view of looking at this is 
the good spirit in the time of pandemic is giving you hope. The bad spirit is giving you despair, okay? And so Ignatius's insight is to listen to that, to listen to the good spirit and to follow it. Ignatius also says that the bad spirit acts in us in certain ways, okay? And he, he uses three um, uh, images. The first, and, and it's basically, I'm telling you this to, to sort of pay attention to what's going on inside of you. The evil spirit acts as what he calls the spoiled child, okay? So a child that, you know, is throwing a tantrum, okay? And that's sometimes how we feel. This is not going right. And I'm sure we feel those feelings of, of rage, right, and anger. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being angry, but you know what I'm talking about. It's that kind of babyish voice inside of us. That is the evil spirit, okay? The second way the evil spirit acts um, uh, is as what he calls the false lover. And, and, you know, Ignatius may have known something about this from personal experience, but, you know, pre-conversion. But the false lover, uh, as Ignatius says, doesn't want uh, his letters, his secret letters to be revealed. So what does that mean for us? It means that the false lover, uh, the evil spirit doesn't want to be revealed. So, you know, it's an invitation to kind of talk to people about some of the struggles you're going through. That's basically it, right? The old AA um, slogan, you're only as sick as your secret. So revealing things, right? And the third way the evil spirit acts is as the army commander who knows your weakest point. So for example, if your weak point is worrying about sickness, right, or health or whatever, the evil spirit's gonna get you there. So it's, it's, it's worth thinking about how the evil spirit works and how the good spirit works. But overall, I would say in the pandemic, trust the voice of hope, okay? Don't trust the voice of despair. Okay, so that's discernment of spirits as an Ignatian tool. The second tool is the examination of conscience. Now, I'm sure that, um, you know, you're all being good at Holy Cross alums. I would hope <laughs> maybe Father Joe LeBran or Father Phil Burroughs or uh, Father Bob Manning or Father Brooks or Bill Campbell or Paul Harmon or, or, or um, you know, one of the people from, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm focusing only on the Jesuits, uh, but one of the lay staff from the, um, the campus ministry taught you with the examine on a retreat. If you don't know the examine, it's a wonderful tool to help you find God in your day. Now, why am I bringing that up? Because in the pandemic, you know, stuck at home and, you know, this kind of uh, very, um, you know, a kind of enervating, well, that's not the right word, it's sort of annoying life, let's be blunt sometimes, you know, we're stuck at home, we, we struggle with our, uh, our, our spouses or our families, we're, 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 we, we feel, you know, I don't have to go into why people don't, are upset during the pandemic. Okay, the point is that the examine helps us to see where God is. Okay, even in days that seem the same. So I want to go over briefly the examine with a focus on um, how we can use it in the pandemic. So the examine essentially has five parts. It's very simple. This is meant to be about a 10 or 15 minute prayer at the end of the day um, or whenever you can pray it. You know, some people pray in the, in the middle of the day or the beginning of the day. It's basically a review of the last 24 hours. So the first thing you do is you place yourself in the presence of God. Okay, we're going to review the day. Now, why do you place yourself in the presence of God? It's because, so it doesn't become just a monologue, you know, so it's not just you kind of going through the day on your own. You know, it's, it's a reminder that you're doing this in God's presence. Second is especially, the second step is especially important in these times in this pandemic, which is uh, gratitude, calling to mind all the things that you're grateful for. Now, I want to spend some time on this because I think in difficult times, we tend to focus just on the problems. All right, we're all naturally problem solvers, right? I mean, that's part of human nature. That can work against us though, um, because as much as we're trying to figure things out, we can overlook the, the graces and the blessings that God has given us, okay? So it's especially important in times of uh, distress um, to focus on the gratitude. Uh, in fact, sometimes when people are very depressed, uh, like some of my um, people that come to me for counseling, I'll ask them to focus just on the gratitude for the examination of conscience. So you call to mind things that you're grateful for. They could be small things. I mean, you know, the, the taste of uh, the coffee in the morning, right? Um, uh, you know, you got a nice, a funny text from someone. Someone sent you a funny YouTube video, you know, that made, that made you laugh. You got a, a phone call from someone you hadn't heard in a while, you know, the Zoom call work that you didn't think it was going to work. I mean, you call these things to mind, you thank God for them, or big things. You know, kind of long-term things, right? You know, I'm I'm happy that my family has been healthy, or I'm happy that my I'm able to sort of maintain healthy relationships in my family, even though they're distant. So, so, so you call these things to mind and you thank God for them. 
The next step in the examination of conscience is to review your day from start to finish, right? You go from start to finish and you see where you've encountered God, you know, um, morning, noon, and night. And it's the, the invitation is to really find God in those moments that you might be overlooking, okay? Relationships, nature, just looking outside, looking wherever you are. I mean, if you're on the campus of Holy Cross, you know, one of the most beautiful campuses in the country to look at the leaves changing, right? I mean, something like that. Look, look throughout your day to see where you have encountered God and also where you've turned away from God. Uh, the fourth step is expressing sorrow for your sins, right? Um, and I, don't, I don't think that Jesus and the Blessed Mother are in this phone call and, or in the Zoom call, so all of us are sinful and imperfect, and we have to kind of acknowledge that before God. And then the last step is looking for grace for the next day. Now, the point is that, you know, many of us are living lives that are starting to seem monastic, okay? I would imagine many people are stuck at home, quarantined at home, working from home, and it can seem very the same, that things can seem the same. And so all the more reason to do the examination of conscience and really look and really notice where God is present in your day. Even if you're quarantined, you have some relations with other people on the phone, through Zoom, right, you know, even just going to the store, are there things that you can look to and see God's presence? See how God is consoling you during the day, right? See how God is blessing you during the day. Because it's much easier to look backwards, right? It's easier to say, I'm sure you all have had the experience where, you know, you've had some terrible experience years ago and you can say, well, now I can see where God was. Well, that's the insight of the examination of conscience, okay? Looking backwards helps you to see where God was, which enables you to see more easily where God is, okay, which is essential in the pandemic because we tend, as I say, to focus just on the negative. So the examine is an antidote to that negativity and can help you find God. Okay, that's the second tool. And finally, the third tool is Ignatian contemplation. Now, we don't have time for an Ignatian contemplation guided meditation, but basically, again, I would hope that many of you um, went on some retreats at, at Holy Cross. If not, that's okay. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Ignatian contemplation with an emphasis on how to use it in the pandemic. Okay. Now, um, many of us actually have more time alone now. Okay. You have more time alone. Many of us are not commuting any longer. Of course, those of us with young kids may have less time, but for many of us, there's more private time. Okay. Because you're, we're not running around outside as much. Therefore, um, it may be a good time to do more Ignatian contemplation. And what is that? Basically, Ignatian contemplation uses your imagination to place yourself in a scene from scripture or in a scene with uh, Jesus, for example, or Mary, okay? So you imagine yourself in the scripture scene. Now, uh, when I was taught this in the novitiate, uh, my first week, uh, pretty much, um, I said to the spiritual director there, uh, David Donovan, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's just, am I just making things up? And he said, no, it's, it's, it's allowing God to work through your imagination, right? Which is a gift. So let's take um, the passage of the storm at sea, uh, which uh, Pope Francis used during his beautiful um, meditation in St. Peter's Square around March, sort of at the height of the, um, the coronavirus, uh, the, the very beginning of it. He talked about the storm at sea, uh, and he talked about inviting Jesus into your boat. Right now, what would you do in an Ignatian contemplation? Well, basically, again, you would place yourself in the presence of God. You know, this would be a little longer than the examination of conscience. You could do this in a half an hour or an hour. And then you start to what Ignatius calls compose the scene. Okay. So, in other words, say, what do I see? Right. You, should, you know, let your imagination, you know, kind of uh, flower. What does the boat look like? You know, am I in there with the disciples? You remember the, the storm at sea where the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee and a storm comes up and Jesus stands up and well, the disciples are upset that he, they think he, you know, aren't you, don't you care about us? We're going to die. And Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. And he says, they say, who is this then that even the wind and the waves obey him? So you imagine yourself, what does it look like? What does Jesus look like? What do the disciples look like? What does the Sea of Galilee look like? It's night, you might remember from that passage. So what's that like? What do I feel, right? I mean, I'm wet, probably. If there's a storm at sea, I'm soaking wet. You know? So now you already get a sense of the disciples maybe being a little uh, antsy, right? And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard enough to be frightened during a storm at sea, but they're miserable being cold. Uh, what do I hear, right? So you hear the fishing tackle 
going back and forth and you hear the waves slapping up against the side, you hear thunder, maybe lightning, the wind, okay? So now you're starting to really get into the scene. Uh, what do I taste? Okay, maybe in this uh, particular meditation, there's not a whole lot about taste, but in others there might be. Um, and then what do I smell? Well, you know, you smell fish, you know, you're in a fishing boat. So you let your imagination go and then you see what comes up. Okay, and this is where, this is where I think God can reveal things to you. So for example, in the middle of the pandemic, you know, you might say, yeah, I'm kind of angry at Jesus too, right? Where is he? He seems asleep in my life, okay? Just like the disciples, they're angry at him. Don't you care, right? It's what, it's what uh, Martha says to him at that table with Martha and Mary. Don't you care? I'm doing all the work. You know, there's a sense of, doesn't God care about us, okay? So can you express those feelings in prayer knowing that God will hear you, right? And knowing that Jesus will hear you, right? So even if it's something as simple as that, being able to express yourself, and then can you take it another step? Can you allow Jesus to speak to you? What might Jesus want to say to you? Or maybe you just notice the disciples and you say, wow, you know, actually they didn't have a whole lot of trust. Maybe I'm being called to, to have more trust. All sorts of things can come up in, in Ignatian contemplation. Desires, you know, to sort of uh, maybe want to have more trust in your life. Emotions, anger we talked about insights like wow maybe i should trust more like the disciples uh, feelings of calm right uh, images words memories might come up a time that uh, you were upset and sort of in a stormy time in the past right so i would i would encourage you to use ignatian contemplation particularly at this time right when people are more at home meaning they're spending more time at home they might have more time at home to really deepen your um understanding of scripture and and to be able to express some of the things that have come up in the pandemic, in these, in these kind of uh, beautiful scenes that you're familiar with. So I don't wanna go on too long. Those are the three tools that I have tonight. Um, first, discernment of spirits, and very briefly, remember that the good spirit, the spirit of God is the spirit of hope. The spirit um, not from God is despair. So to listen to that voice of hope in your life. Um, second, the examina examination of conscience, which will help you see God even in the midst of difficult times, right? And really focus on that gratitude. Uh, and third, Ignatian contemplation, which allows you to enter into a scripture scene um, and in, in a really intentional way uh, and see what God might want to raise up and also to be able to express yourself um, in these scenes to Jesus um, as honestly as you would like. So those are three very simple tools that I think, um, I hope will help you um, they've certainly helped me uh, in this pandemic as we all make our way through it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Father. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of questions that uh, came in via email uh, over the last few days, and we've sorted them a bit to try to uh, focus them on a few different topics. Uh, the first one is, I think, a personal question for you. How do you use God's love to understand, forgive, and even love those who attack you for your stance on many social justice issues? Well, um, that's a good question. I, I don't usually get, uh, usually I don't get too angry at them. I think it's more, for me, uh, it's more about detachment. Uh, and it's more about, you know, what Jesuits call detachment or indifference. I was uh, praying in indignation contemplation um, a couple of years ago, the, the story of the rejection at Nazareth, where Jesus is rejected in Nazareth. Um, you know, that's the, obviously the title of the story. And it dawned on me that at the time, Nazareth was only 200 to 400 people. And you'll recall that he stands up in the synagogue and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then they chase him out of the town. And I remember saying to Jesus, how were you able to do that? You know, because he knew who they, I mean, Nazareth was a small town of 200 to 400 people. So he knew how they were going to respond. He knew that it was going to engender some attacks. And I heard Jesus say to me in prayer, not orally, but I felt the words uh, Jesus say to me were, must everyone like you? Right? And so Jesus invites us to sort of be free of the need for everyone to like us or love us or approve of us. And that's, that's the main um, insight for me that, you know, I, for example, in work with LGBT people and uh, refugees and migrants, um, and in all sorts of other things, things are so contentious. I get attacked, I get called names, and it's it's more that. So it's funny, I don't I don't really, it's funny that I've never thought this. I don't really feel like I need to forgive them because it doesn't really make a claim on me. 
And then also, you know, if I ever, I mean, the, the Ignatian tool of the presupposition of the beginning of the spiritual exercises, which is always give people the benefit of the doubt and always try to treat them charitably. So it's, it's, for me, it's, it's less about the forgiveness and more about the detachment, because at this point, I don't really get too angry about it anymore. Uh, thank God. <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's very uh, kind of you. Um, another question to you personally, uh, how does your faith help you make decisions when it's not clear what the best path is, especially when it involves uh, you know, your own loved ones, people that you have relationships with, that, that you might disagree with um, the direction they're taking? That's a great question. I assume that the question is also asking about something in their own life. Um, but, you know, that's a great question. I think giving people the benefit of the doubt is always really important. So for example, if you have someone in your family that does something, you say, well, that's so selfish, or that's, you know, that, that's the initial response. And so to really say, you know, I love that line. It's so, it, I think 90% of the spiritual life is sort of wrapped up in some of these like trite sayings, but be kind to everyone because they're all fighting a hard battle, right? So everyone in your family is, for, in a different way, fighting a hard battle. So if you can give them the benefit of the doubt, if you can stop sort of prejudging in a sense, if you can be charitable to them, if you can listen to them. But then the other thing, which I think is a really important insight in Jesuit spirituality is you may not be able to save them, right? Or do everything for them or change them. I mean, there are people that we know who have all sorts of problems that don't seem to either are able to change or willing to change. And you can't do that. In fact, I was just writing about this today in this Learning to Pray book. Um, that um, uh, for a long time, my, uh, when I entered the Jesuits, my parents were separated. They, they since got back together. My dad, my dad died in 2000. But in any event, my assistant novice director, I was getting so upset about it because I couldn't make it happen. And he said, you know, you're not God, right? So, so he, he enabled me to see that, you know, we have to embrace our powerlessness in that situation too which is very hard for people, you know, especially when you see people that are struggling. But I would say the main thing is to be open and charitable and to try to give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, and then also, by the way, in terms of discernment, to listen to that voice of calm. Anytime you're saying like, oh, I'm gonna get that person back, that, that's not coming from God. That's the evil spirit. Speaking. That is the evil spirit. Yeah, you know, I'll show them. You know, so again, remember the drop of water on the sponge would say to you, you're doing fine, calm down. You'll be able to help them. Don't worry. You know what I mean? That, that's, the, that's the good spirit. That, that's very um, practical. Uh, there's a timely question about how we should balance patriotism and our faith. You know, our, our love of our country and our love of our faith. Oh, that's a hard question. Um, you know, gee, I've never really been asked that question. I, I, I love America, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm an American. I'm very proud and of And the magazine, of course. And, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the country. I love, I love the magazine too, um, and the website. Um, but you know, I think our faith should come first. Uh, but I, you know, it's funny. I assume that's a that's a question about the the upcoming election. You know, there's a great. Um, it it may be, it may not be, but you know, there's a great document from the U.S. Bishops Conference called uh, "Faithful Citizenship," that talks about um, you know using our faith to make good decisions. It's about discernment, right? Uh, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that's difficult for people is in this very contentious time is, is to be reminded that, you know, ultimately it's up to your conscience, right? So what does that mean? It means you, you know the gospels, right? You know what Jesus's message is. You understand church teaching right? as best as you can. I mean, we, we can't possibly understand every single thing the church has ever taught, but as best you can, you understand church teaching on the big issues. And then you use your conscience, you know, and vote. So, you know, in a sense, what happens is I think our faith enables us through our conscience, right? I mean, where I'm speaking to believers here, our faith enables us to make good decisions. I really do think that. I think God will help to move us to make good decisions. So I don't think those two things are really in conflict. I mean, they're usually not in conflict. Sometimes they are, but usually not. Uh, yesterday, I believe you retweeted a quote from Pope Francis uh, who called tax evasion uh, part of the structure of sin. Uh, what do you think of the New York Times revelations over the weekend? This is particularly important to remind folks that you were a, a Wharton School undergraduate. So 
You must yes. be an expert on this matter. <laughs> yes. Instead of going to Holy Cross, I went to Wharton. Um, and I did work for GE for six years. Formerly, comp company has kind of been on hard times lately. In any event. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too political, but I will say that, um, you know, so prescinding uh, President Trump, I will say that, uh, you know, Pope Francis is, he's not making things up. I mean, uh, Catholic social teaching talks about structural sin. What does that mean? It means sin that's kind of built into the system itself, right? So, uh, you know, uh, as, as uh, Dom Helder Camera, the great um, Brazilian archbishop used to say, I love this idea. You know, they, they, I feed the poor, they, they call me a saint. I ask why they're, why they're poor, they call me a communist, right? So it's not Marxism or socialism, it's, it's Catholic social teaching. So why are, they, why are they poor? Why are people poor? And what Pope Francis is talking about, which I agree with, is that, you know, um, if you have companies that are making billions of dollars and people are making millions of dollars and they're paying zero, something's wrong. Right. Uh, I saw a chart in the paper today that said that, you know, they had all the different um, uh, 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 careers that pay more than, you know, than the president did. It, you know, it was like a nurse would pay. Think, imagine like a nurse who's working in, with COVID patients. She's paying more taxes, you know. And so what Pope Francis was doing is he was linking that um, tax evasion, right, and these tax loopholes, which are, you know, legal, of course, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily just to a lack of um, public funds for things. And I think we see that in the United States, right? I mean, you know, as I said, I'm a proud American, but you go to other, other countries where there's much more given to um, sort of the common good, right? So public transportation is better and their public, basic public services are better, the safety net is better. That's the idea. And so when people are able to pay no taxes and, Business, you know, I, I was at GE when we paid no taxes, you know, because of all these loopholes. Something's wrong, right? I mean, I, I think that that's just not just. And in any event, Pope Francis, by the way, everybody thought he was. He's not commenting on any stuff that's going on right now. This was a speech that he gave, I think, in March or April. So he's just, he's just explicating Catholic social teaching. And it's about the common good, Great. which sometimes does. We talked about politics and faith sometimes does sort of um, bump up against um, the American way of doing things. You know, we're not, we're not always focused on the common good, everybody. Sure. So, that, 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 you know, it's a difference between what we learned at Wharton, right? Which is, you know, supply and demand and you bottom know, line. every person for himself and the bottom line and the common good. That's, it's just different. Good question though. Yeah, great. Uh, well, changing up a bit, um, how can women, parents of girls, Parents of LGBTQ children support a church that does not value them as equals. Well, these are these are really. I was expecting some easier questions, but um, I would say this. I, I say this to, to. I don't want to lump both groups together because there's different there's different issues with both groups. I think by um, claiming your and, and I'm going to say this as a, a you know as a white male um, who's ordained. Um, I think by claiming your baptismal right in the church, I think many women and LGBT people and, and, and all sorts of other groups, but mostly those groups, I would say, um, feel disenfranchised, feel pushed out, okay? Feel like they're not a part, but they are. They are as much a part of the church as the Pope, as your local bishop, as your pastor, as me, right? And so the first thing is to claim that baptismal um, identity. You know, as far as women go, um, I always say that, you know, uh, the, the person to whom Jesus, the risen Christ, appeared first uh, on Easter Sunday was Mary Magdalene, as you know, right? You could have appeared to all sorts of other people, but it was to her, at least in the Gospel of John, that he appears. Uh, and interestingly, between the time that the risen Christ appears to Mary Magdalene, right, and, and reveals the resurrection to her, right, and the time that she announces the good news to the disciples, right? Let's say that's an hour. So at the tomb, right, she, she encounters the risen Christ. And then she runs. We presume that she runs to announce it to the disciples. I have seen the Lord, right? In that time, Mary Magdalene is the church on earth. Hmm. Okay, because only to her has been revealed the whole Paschal mystery, right? The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. She's the only one that understands it for that hour. Okay, and then she becomes the apostle to the apostles. 
And in telling that creates a community, okay? I think that any discussion of women's leadership roles in the church has to begin with her. All right, now, as far as LGBTQ people, I think that they are even more marginalized than women. That's sometimes a controversial statement, but you know, in the Vatican, Pope Francis can talk about women having more incisive roles in leadership, and he, you know, he appoints them as, uh, you know, heads of pontifical uh, uh, universities. And, and I mean, they really, he's really done a lot to bring in women to really high, high-level decision-making roles. Not all of them, of course. Um, there's nothing like that for LGBT people. There's no, he's not coming out and saying we need more gay people in decision-making roles. I mean, you know, you can make a joke and say there already are, but there, there's nothing like that. And you know, there's International Women's Day at the Vatican. There's not International LGBTQ Day. I mean, they really are treated like lepers in the church, right? And we have to be clear about that. And one of the things I'm trying to do, along with a lot of other people, is to, um, you know, encourage people to welcome them. But again, it's the same baptismal call. An LGBTQ person, uh, an LGBTQ Catholic is every much as a, every much every bit as is every what am I trying to say is every is just as much Catholic as the Pope is okay because of that baptism. So I, I think to ground yourself and also to say that you might be the leaven that the Church needs right now. All right, Jesus Christ Himself calls you into the Church at your baptism, and who's to say that you do not have a big role to play, right in making the church more open for women and for LGBT people. Who's to say that that is not your call? Through advocacy with, within your own community, for instance. Absolutely, be leaven, right. Great. Uh, well, our faith is in the news, again, in a political sense, with the nomination of Amy Coney. Uh, <laughs> these questions are so hard. Well, you know, uh, no, these are hard times. Uh, so I, we had a two-part question on that. Your, your thoughts on the nomination, and then I think some advice for how we as Catholics can be respectful of her beliefs if we oppose her judicial philosophy. Yeah, I'm not going to comment on the nomination because I'm okay. not a lawyer, and I'm not a so. And I know you know that I'm not. I just I would have very little to say other than what you all read in the papers. Now, however. Um, uh, you know, look, there is some anti-Catholicism in this country. I wrote an article in 2000. You can look it up. It's called Anti-Catholicism in the United States. You know, it's there, okay? But not every question that is asked of a, 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 a potential Supre a Supreme Court nominee or a presidential candidate that asks them about their faith is anti-Catholic, okay? We have to be clear about that, right? And I think people uh, are interested in, in how her faith life plays out. Right now, I mean, some people said that you can you can see that in her decisions, which may be true, but I think it's reasonable to ask respectful questions about how your faith life influences your public life. So I think that's reasonable. I mean, I, I mean, I think if 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 people were in any other faith, right? I think that's a reasonable question, especially for people who are not Catholic who who want to understand that. Now, there's ways of asking that that are offensive and that are not offensive. So I think it would be perfectly legitimate to ask um, Judge Barrett, you know, at this hearing, per, per, look, I'm not a legal scholar, but can you tell us a little bit about how your faith influences your public life? That's simple. Can you tell us a little bit about how Catholic social teaching may influence your decisions? Now, she can answer or not answer it, but I think those are legitimate, reasonable, and respectful questions, and I don't think they're particularly anti-Catholic. Fair enough. Uh... I wondered, uh, turn some attention to the pandemic. Um, can you discuss the role of hope uh, in being a Catholic, in particular uh, in, in these times? You did cover some of it in your uh, three points earlier, but how important is hope and how do you channel it? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely essential. I mean, it, it is essential. We are, that we say, you know, people of hope. And I mean, uh, if you don't have hope, right, I mean, that you're, I think you're, you're done for, right? I mean, if I didn't have hope that there would be a vaccine soon, that we could get through this, that my Jesuit community could get through this, that my family could get through this, that my friend could get through this, I think, you know, in a sense, what's the point? Now, where does our hope come from? Our hope is not just optimism. Our hope is, I mean, our hope is in the name of the Lord, you know, as the Psalm said, but our hope to go back to the, to the resurrection um, is grounded in the resurrection in the story of the resurrection, right? I mean, the disciples on Good Friday and Holy Saturday, I feel like we're in a Holy Saturday moment, right? We're just waiting, right? Yeah. Could see nothing good coming, 
right? And I think we have to remember that the, the story of Christianity uh, is this great surprise from God, right? Who, who can change things in an instant, all right? So now there's lots of signs of God in the pandemic itself. I mean, the, the selfless healthcare workers, the nurses, the doctors, the responders, the essential workers, right? All sorts of things that people are doing. But I think beyond that, we have to have hope in God. And, you know, the message of of, of the, what the, what the angel says to uh, Mary at the Annunciation is nothing is impossible with God, which is also the, the, the message of the resurrection, right? So we really have to ground ourselves in that. And this is, this is a, this is a, this is, a, this is a faith question. This is an assent, right? We say yes to that. So hope is something you have to participate in, right? It's, it's in a sense, it's a decision. Uh, so it's essential. I mean, I, I think without hope, uh, I don't think we'd be able to get through the pandemic. I mean, why would people, why would people even work on a vaccine, right? Why would the doctors work on a vaccine if they didn't have hope? But our hope is grounded in this knowledge that God is able to do impossible things. Sure, fair enough. Um, and, and with the pandemic in mind also, what, how would you counsel folks who've lost friends and family members to the seemingly random nature of this? It's uh, you know, we all accept risks in everyday life, but this, this one seems to be so random. It is, and it's also hard to grieve because, you know, right. you can't see your loved ones if they're in the hospital. You, I mean, especially at the beginning, you couldn't go to funerals. I had a friend's father die, and his mother couldn't even get out of the car uh, and had to be driven to the grave site and just look out the window. I mean, I, it's really heartbreaking. And so there's a sense of... Um, you know, kind of a, there's, I hate the word closure, but there's this sense of things not being able to be complete, you know, as you would like. I would say um, that the thing I always go back to is when you're praying, when you're, when you're praying to Jesus, okay, which I think is essential, you're praying to someone who understands you not only because he is divine and knows all things, I mean, God knows all things and God knows what you're going through, but he's human and he experienced all these things. I mean, Jesus would have been alive in a time of disease, right? Uh, I'm reading a, a novel about Lazarus now because I'm working on a book on Lazarus next. It's called Lazarus is Dead by Richard Beard. And he talks about the, the different ways that Lazarus could have died and the illnesses back then and scabies and smallpox. And they would have had pandemics then. And, and people who were, you know, there's a reason why lepers were, were quarantined in a sense, right? So Jesus understood that world. So to be able to go to him in prayer and, and express yourself, um, and also not to be afraid of your emotions, right? I mean, people are struggling with not only sadness and fear, but also anger, right? I mean, people who've lost loved ones who have not been able to grieve in the right way. Now, I mean, you know, imagine, you know, I know a lot of Jesuits, unfortunately, have died too, and, you know, not being able to have a funeral and not being able to celebrate their lives and not be able to bring people together. Some people, in a sense, look forward to that, right? Look forward to that as a way of being consoled. So to express all those feelings, and maybe Ignatian contemplation is one way to do that, to Jesus. And to know that he's someone who, understand, again, understands you completely, divine and human. Great. That's very helpful. Um, you've, uh, you have a insight unique to this phone call, I think, into uh, Pope Francis uh, having um, had some conversations with him, I suspect, over the years. Uh, what, what is the effect, uh, what would you summarize the effect of a Jesuit Pope on the Vatican and, uh, you know, and the, the Catholic Church as we know it? Can you, can you see change already? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I only have one. I had a conversation with him a year ago this month, actually, uh, an audience where we talked about LGBT stuff. Um, so I don't know him that well, but I think that the I think that the College of Cardinals didn't know what they were getting. <laughs> I think they forgot they elected a Jesuit. So his way, I think, what he's been basically doing is is leading us all through a big discernment. He's done that through the synods. Um, you know, he's asked for people to speak up. Uh, I think that's one of the things he's been doing. I think also, you know, he talks to us a lot about prayer and, and imagining ourselves uh, in the scripture scenes. He's turned, uh, he's turned the church more, I would say, you know, obviously all the popes have talked about this, but he really is insistent about look, asking us to look at the poor, okay? Um, and he really trusts in the Holy Spirit. I think one of the great difficulties is that a lot of his 
uh, opponents, you know, when, when one, of the, one of the key things about his pontificate is that he trusts the individual conscience. So for example, in his uh, apostolic letter, Amoris Laetitia, um, he, he talks a lot about conscience, right? And, and people don't like that, you know, because that was a teaching, it's, it's central to Catholic teaching, that was um, kind of, I would say, soft pedaled for the last 30 or 40 years. And so when he talks about conscience, people think he's making this up or he's being a, he's being a terrible pope or he's not, well, no, that's actually Catholic teaching. And I think if you drill down um, past the politics and theology and even spirituality in his opponents, I think a lot of his opponents simply don't trust that, that an individual person, an individual Catholic can make a good and well-reasoned decision based on his or her conscience. And Pope, Fra pope Francis certainly does. And I think that's at the heart of the difficulty. And one of the reasons is, as we were talking about, you know, Jesuits, not that other people don't, but Jesuits are really attuned to that. I mean, this is, this is a guy who was a spiritual director and a novice director, and he listened to people, he listened to people's prayers, he reverences people's prayer. So it's not just about um, a top-down rule-based organization, it's about uh, helping people encounter Christ uh, in, their, in their interior lives and helping them discern good decisions. And that's classically Jesuit, and I think that that has uh, upset the apple cart quite a bit. To a degree that we'll see beyond Pope Francis's uh, service, or I mean, do you think it'll change the way the v Vatican Inc. operates going forward? Or I don't know. You know, I'm not really. I, I don't go over there much, and I'm I'm a very low level uh, person on that dicastery. But he's trying his best. But you know, it is it's it's a culture over there. It's a real culture that needs to be changed and. The next pope could have totally different ideas. I remember um, there was a documentary called, I think it was The Francis Effect. And um, they, they were interviewing uh, John O'Malley, who was the great Jesuit historian. And they said, oh, could we ever go back to the way it was before? Because I think the, pr the previous commentator, whoever it was, said, oh no, it's, it's changed forever. And John O'Malley said, sure, what, can, what was done can be undone. Oh, great. <laughs> so I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of it depends on, on who's Pope, but I do think that he's really stirred things up in a, in a good way. As he said, he's made a mess in a good way. It's, it's very Jesuit. Um, shifting gears a little, uh, Black Lives Matter would be, wouldn't be uh, fair to not ask a question about Black Lives Matter and the role that um, our faith can play and the Jesuits can play in that current um, situation, I guess. Uh, well, um, I would say that, um, you know, what I would say two resources that I would point to. First of all, um, there was a great speech by Father Brian Massingale, who's a Fordham University uh, theologian. That's a Jesuit school out here. It's not Holy Cross. Um, uh, he did a great thing at the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice on racism in the Catholic, and the Ignatian tradition, which is excellent. Uh, one, of the one of his insights, which actually blew my mind. It's one of the best speeches or lectures I've heard on any topic ever. I mean, I really recommend it highly. Wow. One of his insights was the discussion about racism. Uh, the boundaries of the discussion of racism are white people's comfort. Hmm. Right? So as soon as white people get uncomfortable, it's like, I don't want to talk about it. But that, so he's, he's ta asking us to kind of push those boundaries a little bit. Look, racism is a sin. Right? I mean, that's St. That's John Paul, that's the U.S. bishops, that's, that's Catholic teaching, right? And so we need to, and we need to look at it uh, as a structural sin, right? It's not just individuals, it's built into the system. I think everybody can see that, right? I mean, it's built into the system. Things like redlining, for example, right? It's, it's really insidious, okay? Um, I, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to be able to explain it in a few words, but I think people, people really understand that. So we're called as Catholics to work against structural sin, right? And, and the sin of racism. And I think for a lot of white people, myself included, um, in the last year or so, um, you know, we've been, um, you know, I would say educated, right? Um, by just how deeply, um, deeply rooted this, this sin is. And so, you know, as in all sorts of other sins, we have to really address it. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I think that's pretty clear, but I would recommend, oh, the other, the other, uh, 
resource is a, a book that's coming out in a couple of months by a friend of mine named Olga Segura, um, and it's called The Birth of a Movement, um, Black Lives Matter in the Catholic Church. So those are the two places I would look to. I mean, because as a white guy, I really, I look to them for my, my education. Great, thanks for that recommendation, or oh, those recommendations. Um, one of the um, questions that was submitted mentioned that in your talk about forgiveness for Sunday Gospel on September 13th, uh, you mentioned that we should be kind to ourselves. Uh, and we were wondering if you could explain uh, how we could do that. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, there's three loves. You know, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So the three loves are love of God, which I think we'd all agree with, um, love of neighbor, which we would agree with. I mean, that's, Jesus talks about that. Love of self. I mean, to say love your neighbor as yourself means that you love yourself. What does that mean? Uh, first of all, uh, it means that you believe that you're a beloved child of God, right? No matter who you are, um, gay or straight, you know, black, brown, or white, um, man or woman, um, transgender, LGBT, um, whatever race you are, um, young or old, you know, ill or in good health, right? Rich or poor, you are beloved by God. So that's part of loving yourself. And, you know, the old bumper sticker, you know, God doesn't make crap. I mean, people laugh at it, but it's true. You know, you are beloved, okay? It's hard sometimes for people to really accept that. And I think especially, um, I think LGBT people, I don't want to focus on, on them too much. Uh, and then people who are poor, you know, people who are, you know, migrants and refugees, people who are seen on the margins, who are kind of sort of shut out. But there's also all sorts of other bullying that goes on and young people struggle with that. So that's the first thing. To understand yourself as a beloved creation of God, whom God loves, all right? Um, the second thing is, I think, maybe more for adults, is, is forgiving yourself. Forgiving yourself for not being perfect, all right? Forgiving yourself for, for sinning. I mean, we all sin. So you go to confession, I hope, you know, from time to time, if it's a, if it's a mortal sin or if you really have, you know, you really need to see a priest. I guess most people haven't been going recently, but we're conscious of our sins, is what I'm saying. In the spiritual exercises, we talk about being a loved sinner, okay? So that's someone who's sinful but loved by God. And I think that's really what, what all this has to do with loving yourself. So can you love yourself as you are? Um, can you love yourself as a human being, right? You're not perfect. Um, as my current spiritual director likes to say, there's good news and there's better news. The good news is that there is a Messiah. The better news is it's not you. So that means you're not perfect. So can you forgive yourself as well? Great. Well, those are, those are great uh, points to help us manage, with, manage the uh, challenge of being human. And one final question, I think, so we can uh, stick to our original timeline. The final question I had for you was about the future of the world with or without Jesuits. Um, there are less of you. Um, take us 50 years ahead, what will, what role, I mean, how do we <laughs> make sure that the Jesuit presence is felt 50 or 100 years from now? Well, when Father Arupe, Pedro Arupe, the Superior General from 1965 to 1983 was asked, you know, where is the Society of Jesus going? And he said, I have no idea. <laughs> he he <laughs> didn't the say Holy, Right, the Holy Spirit's in charge. You know, but certainly, you know, at least in the United States, it seems like we're getting, you know, fewer and fewer. But that doesn't mean that, first of all, I think in 50 years, there'll be Jesuits, but that doesn't mean that the charism is going anywhere, right? Um, you look at, for example, let's look at Holy Cross, all right? Let's look at campus ministry at Holy Cross and all the wonderful work that they do. I mean, I know they do great work, right? It's not all Jesuits, okay? It's not all men, right? It's it's people who are animated by um, by the Jesuit uh, by Jesuit spirituality and by the Ignatian charism, okay? So I do think that Jesuits are essential um, at a Jesuit university, right? Or obviously, you know, a Jesuit apostolate. But obviously, right? I mean, the, the gifts of Ignatian spirituality are for everyone, right? Some of my best spiritual directors have been women, right? Lay women. So I'm not, I'm not too worried, really. I think that the charism and the spirituality is so powerful and so strong and so unique um, that it will continue even if there's only, you know, one Jesuit at Holy Cross, right? Great. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm hopeful, actually. Let's hope you know, that's I, I asked this of a sister once, Sister Janice Farnham, who was a church historian, 
she's a religious of Jesus as, and Jesus, she's a religious of Jesus and Mary. She's taught at the old Western School of Theology. And she said to me, uh, we're talking about sort of diminishing numbers and her order is diminishing as well. You know what she said? She said, when was the Society of Jesus strongest? And of course my answer was, you know, the first companions, you know, they were like seven or eight. And then they, they did pretty well. That's, that's uh, a good point. We hope we don't, hope we don't get down to that view. No, but... I know, but I would also say pray for vocations, as they say. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for being so generous with your time this evening, Father Martin. Uh, and, and speaking of generosity, we offered uh, Father Martin a chance uh, for a little honorarium or some, some sort of a gift to a charity of his choice. And uh, to show you his character, he encouraged us to buy a bunch of his books and donate them uh, to a counseling center at Holy Cross so that uh, people could use them to help get you know, a little, little bit of self-healing. So thank you for that, Father. We've done that and uh, we'll be stocking the bookshelves in the uh, uh, Holy Cross Counseling Center with your uh, writings. So thank you. thanks again for that. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, we, we hope to welcome you at future virtual alumni events in the coming months. This is the new way of doing things until uh, the situation changes, but uh, I think it works well. And Father, I wonder if I could ask you for one more indulgence. Uh, could you lead us in the closing prayer tonight? Yeah, let's just do something a little different. Uh, let's just take a moment. I know we're all in different places. I can imagine people in their homes and, and their apartments and maybe in their dorm rooms. Let's just take a moment and uh, just take a deep breath and be quiet. Take a big deep breath. Well, let's call to mind one thing that we're grateful for today. Just one thing. And let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the blessings you give us, even in the midst of this pandemic. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your Son, who is risen and present to us. As we make our way through this journey, through this uncertain time, help us to be attentive to your voice in our lives. Give us that good spirit and fill us with hope. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, th thanks again, Father. And uh, thank you to all of you who tuned in this evening. Thank you. Well. Keep me in your, please keep me in your prayers, too. Thank you.